What are we watching? Filmation's Ghostbusters. Never heard of it. When are you going to fix my arms? I'm gonna get some water. This show sucks. We gotta get back to the past, to the 20th century. Digging through the bubble wrap into your memories. Back is the collector. He's protecting what we find. The label is heavy little guns. Keep us safe through time. We all know the name Filmation. Founded by Lou Scheimer in the 1960s, Filmation created many cartoon classics, including Superman, the award-winning Star Trek The Animated Series, and their most famous creation, Masters of the Universe. At the same time Filmation was making He-Man's World of Eternia, they were also negotiating with Columbia Pictures, who wanted to borrow the name Ghostbusters for a little comedy they were making with Bill Murray. Filmation owned the rights to the name Ghostbusters. They had made a short-lived live-action children's show in the 1970s called The Ghostbusters, which in no way resembled the movie that Columbia would make. Unfortunately, Filmation didn't secure the animation rights along with the title. So when Columbia Pictures started developing an animated spin-off of their hit movie with Deke Animation Studio, Filmation decided to flex its intellectual property rights by making a competing series based on its live-action original show. In order to distinguish their series and show their amazing douchebaggery, Columbia named their show The Real Ghostbusters. Regardless of how you feel about which series is better, the fact is that Filmation's Ghostbusters were the original characters, and hence they are more deserving of being called The Real Ghostbusters. Either way, in 1986, kids were given two Ghostbusters cartoons and toy lines simultaneously. The 1970s live-action series The Ghostbusters was a slapstick show featuring the bumbling characters Jake Kong, Eddie Spencer, and Tracy the Gorilla. The animated spin-off maintains the slapstick tone and includes the original characters who pass the ghost-busting torch to their adult sons, Jake Kong Jr. and Eddie Spencer Jr. The ape is also still ghost-busting and apparently hasn't aged much. Wait a minute. Eddie Spencer, Tracy, Spencer Tracy, Jake Kong, King Kong, but Tracy the Ape isn't the one named Kong. What? Anyway, the premise of the show is that the Ghostbusters and their friends try to protect the world from prime evil, an evil robot ghost wizard who is trapped in the fifth dimension. No, not that fifth dimension. He sends his minions through the dimensional veil in his place to help him take over the world. He succeeds in kidnapping the original Ghostbusters, our hero's fathers, prompting them to go on a quest through time and space to find them. In addition to their original concept, Filmation added some new elements, presumably to make the show more marketable to an 80s audience. There was time travel, robots, and travel to key historical times and places such as the building of the pyramids, the Salem witch trials, and the time of Merlin and Camelot. Ghosts were often not simply specters, but were half-robot. 
references to classic cinema and TV continued, such as Apparitia, who sounds like Mae West, and Mysteria, who looks like Lily Munster. Kids in 1986 ran home after school, sat down in front of the TV, and expected to see Peter Venkman and Ray Stantz wisecracking and busting ghosts. Instead, they were confronted with a very different cartoon, filled with unfamiliar characters. And because it wasn't the movie Ghostbusters, they probably decided that homework was preferable to watching TV. Why wasn't the show more successful? It had a name that assured plenty of kids would tune in. It had a flying car, an animal sidekick, time travel, and robots. 80s kids loved that stuff. From the first few minutes of the original episode, the series is doomed. The Ghostbusters have at their disposal an arsenal of really stupid weapons. The Dematerializer, which in Pac-Man-like fashion only makes the ghosts go away for a limited time, and then they're back in the next episode. The Ghost Gummer. This asinine contraption shoots blobs of bubblicious at the ghosts. Ghosts can pass through walls and doors, but a sticky glob of crud can stop them, apparently. The Spectre Snare. This is a lasso launcher to tie up ghosts. You're seeing the problems here, right? The Ghostbusters also wear ghost packs, which I guess are like Mary Poppins' carpet bag or any Looney Tunes back pocket. They can store everything they need inside it, any size. Whenever they need their unwieldy weapons, no problem. They can just reach behind their backs and whip them out. All of the heroes are zany, incompetent goofballs. The only smart and competent character on the team is Tracy, the ape. Jake and Eddie are just idiots, screaming wildly, running in place, and never succeeding with any grace or confidence. This was in keeping with the 1970s television show, so why is it a problem? In the first episode, the Ghostbusters trap Primeval in a cave and wipe their hands of it, saying he won't get out for a hundred years. So our heroes decide to kick the can down the road into the future, rather than permanently solve the problem. It's amazing how confident they are that nobody will ever attempt to reopen that mine shaft in their lifetime, especially given that they didn't post a sign or alert the authorities to guard it. Of course, in the far-flung future, Primeval is accidentally let out and wreaks havoc, so a future Ghostbuster named Futura returns to the past to get help. Why she didn't have a record of her ancestral Ghostbusters trapping Primeval in the cave is again another failing on the part of our heroes. Good records keeping is important. Primeval sets up shop in the fifth dimension, playing his cosmic organ and generally acts flamboyant and inept. He's kind of a proto-General Grievous, with a stable of ghoulish thugs that do his bidding. Like the heroes, they're all caricatures of silliness. He hand-selects a few in each episode to go back to the past, conquer the Earth, and stop the Ghostbusters. We're never sure how the Ghostbusters pay their bills. Their headquarters is overrun by ghosts, including a grumpy ghost telephone that always tries to block customer calls. I'm guessing this is supposed to be funny, but it makes very little sense to me. Why would you surround yourself with apparitions that are making your life difficult? You're the Ghostbusters. Conversely, why would any self-respecting ghost want to work for the local ghost Gestapo? It's the paranormal equivalent of collaborators. When they get the call for an assignment, Filmation begins a stock footage sequence that is repeated in one form or another in every episode. This isn't bad or unusual. Lots of cartoons had a sequence like this. He-Man, Voltron, Thundercats, Rambo. They all had a stock sequence. The issue with the Ghostbusters sequence is the running time. It runs for a good chunk of the episode. The intent of this sequence is to show them changing into their Ghostbusters outfits, which are safari jackets and some boots. So why do they have to go into a demonic dimension to accomplish that? It looks like something out of a white zombie music video. Also, they can change their clothes. Couldn't they just grab some jackets off some hangers in a fraction of the time? Jake Kong enjoys this process far too much. He starts the sequence with a rape face and a high five, like a frat boy with a plan. When the demonic dimension strips off all his clothes, he's visibly loving every second of it and makes sure to execute the daintiest ballet landing upon completion of his outfitting. What generally follows after this is 15 minutes or so of plotless, zany waffle. Filmation conceived a show without rules or boundaries. Now on its face, this might work for a paranormal adventure series. In fact, Retro Blasting subscriber and Filmation Ghostbusters fan Spiros 
theorizes that the Ghostbusters television show by Filmation may have been based on the earliest drafts of Dan Aykroyd's feature film script. Columbia Pictures deemed this version unfilmable because the Ghostbusters went to alternate dimensions. This concept was eventually explored by Aykroyd in the Ghostbusters video game. But if there's a chance Filmation was privy to this early concept during the initial talks with Columbia Pictures, then it may be the reason Filmation's Ghostbusters is so surreal. However, this cartoon goes beyond intellectual exploration and lands square in the middle of inane. For example, in one episode, they fly their ghost buggy up into the sky during a thunderstorm to get their reporter friend Jessica to go somewhere with them. She's hovering in a helicopter over the city, and she's the only pilot. The Ghostbusters jet car stops in midair, they remove her from the helicopter, and just fly off, leaving the copter idling over a populated area. Or how about when the ghosts in their headquarters take over, and they cannot change into their ghost-busting gear? No problem. Tracy's hat is a portable changing dimension, so he just shoves them into his fedora. Makes you wish they'd just do that in every episode, because it didn't take as long. But at the same time, it's a cheap, lazy way out of a narrative problem the writers put themselves in. The Ghostbusters car can turn into an airplane, a boat, and a submarine. And it can even time travel at will. And when you have the ability to time travel, well, you know the problems that come along with that in any plot if you've seen Superman the movie. Problems for time traveling characters are irrelevant, because theoretically a time traveler could just go back to a point before the problem occurred and stop it from ever happening. The ghost buggy has no limits. At all. It doesn't run on plutonium. It's pure magic. This show is filled with these kinds of creative cop-outs. How can you have tension or suspense if you can imagine any solution and it will just happen? Remember the trash can. Trash can, what are you talking about? So we're saddled with a universally silly cast in a fatally limitless dreamscape. Could it get any worse? Why yes, it can. There's no satisfying action element to this show. The Ghostbusters show up to tackle Primeval's goons, but they always choke. If they're not misfiring their weapons, they're just taking forever to throw down on them. You'll see these guys brandish their ray guns and wait and talk and wait and then get trounced by the monster because they gave them a full minute to react. This happens all the time and it's infuriating. With the real Ghostbusters firing up their proton packs with paranormal impunity, the Filmation version plays like a juvenile Keystone Cops. The creators didn't target the right audience, and the show was out of touch stylistically. More Scooby-Doo and less Star Wars. As a kid, I didn't like watching idiots in the role of heroes. I liked someone stronger, smarter, and savvier than I was to look up to. Ghostbusters is frustrating to watch because there's no one for me to get behind. The villains are goofy, the heroes are goofy, the ghosts are goofy, the cars are goofy, the situations are goofy. You see the problem here? If the heroes are just as incompetent as the villains, then where's the heroism? And conversely, where's the threat? Jake Kong and Prime Evil are interchangeable in the broad sense. They're both doofuses with nothing grounding them. However, I know there are plenty of people who don't feel that way. Fans of the show appreciate Ghostbusters for its great artwork and original score. They enjoy the heroes being novices, unlike the film Ghostbusters, because it allows the viewer to feel more similar to the main characters and imagine how they themselves might fare against a ghost. They love the idea of another dimension existing alongside our own and the inclusion of time travel. They admire the clothing styles of the heroes as well as their cool home base, which is filled with mystical artifacts and is located in downtown New York in between what some say looks like the Twin Towers. And these are all great aspects of the show. So why was Filmation's Ghostbusters ultimately not that successful? Well, it had two big problems. For starters, it showed Filmation hadn't properly sized up the competition. The real Ghostbusters aimed at slightly older kids because the movie had proven that despite being a comedy, the ghosts and the action were still serious business. So the comedy in real Ghostbusters was reserved for interactions between Slimer and Venkman or random quips between the main characters. When they were on the job, though, it was all business. Filmation's Ghostbusters missed this mark in a big way. The style of humor is outdated. Heck, it was outdated in 1986, and the lack of any seriousness when put up against the competition makes Filmation's Ghostbusters come off as fatally childish. 
But the main reason it wasn't successful is that despite its name, it wasn't the famous movie version that kids were familiar with. No matter how cool it was, it was most likely doomed from the outset. This is hard for me to say, because I really love Filmation and Lou Scheimer. But I think The Real Ghostbusters is a far superior show to Filmation's animated Ghostbusters. That said, I also have to face up to the fact that Real Ghostbusters was born out of the ultimate thievery on the part of Columbia Pictures. The tragedy of it all is after being screwed over by Columbia Pictures, Filmation flubbed its own animated series in a Gerald Ford scale tumble. This spelled doom for their action figure series, which in many ways was one of the best action figure lines ever created for a cartoon. <laughs> If there's no heroism... I liked my hero... My heroes? I'm gonna get some water. I'm gonna get some water. I'm gonna get some water!